Persistent lower GI bleeding. Uh, I, I want to put some um, acute care surgery topics um, in, in to this conference because I think it's important. And this is particularly important topic because we see this quite often. We are asked to see patients on the medicine service in the medicine ICU with a GI bleed. And uh, we always um, go through that exercise of trying to define where the hemorrhage is, what the etiology is. And uh, some of these people bleed more than once and recurrent bleeding is a major issue. So um, I wanna go over what's out there uh, and some uh, diagnostic modalities, some um, uh, new uh, technology that has been introduced in the field of gastroenterology in an attempt to help us uh, figure this out. So the first thing is defining what l persistent lower GI bleed is. And lower GI bleed is anatomically defined as bleeding beyond the ligament of trites. So just thinking about that, you will very quickly conclude that lower GI bleed is a misnomer because it's not really lower GI bleed if it's in the proximal jejunum, but the manifestation is very similar whether you bleed from the mid jejunum or whether you bleed from, from um, the distal ileum or for, uh, from the colon. So there is a diverse range of bleeding sources and severities. And you can have uh, patients presenting with very little bleeding from hemorrhoids to massive blood loss from vascular, uh, vascularized small bowel tumors. Uh, the epidemiology is also very important. You gotta remember, every time you're called to see somebody with upper GI bleed on the medicine service, or most of the time, you're gonna see an elderly patient. It's the most common gastrointestinal indication for hospital admission. And the annual incidence of hospitalization is estimated to be 20 to 30 per 1,000 uh, per 100,000 persons. So about 100 to 200 per 100,000 in the elderly population uh, or those individuals that have age greater than 75. Uh, it affects, again, predominantly the elder population. In most patients with lower GI bleed, they have favorable outcomes despite advanced age and comorbid conditions. So although it's frequent, it's important, it's not as fatal as we think it is, but it requires a tremendous amount of uh, work to figure out the sources and uh, to manage them. A number of etiologies, a number of causes of uh, lower GI bleed, uh, obviously the most common ones are diverticular disease, hemorrhoids, uh, perhaps in the, in the elderly population, angiodysplasia and, and some forms of uh, um, colorectal cancer. Obviously, uh, inflammatory bowel disease is more prevalent in younger individuals, uh, but other causes such as infectious colitis, we just had a patient on the service, or uh, colonic ulcers and post-traumatic, particularly after endoscopic procedures, are not uncommon. So if you look at this table, uh, that describes to you all those, the, those sources of bleeding that I, I had in the previous slide, you will see that pretty much diverticular disease is the most prevalent one. Uh, and then depending on where the study is done and what the cohort of patients that they are analyzing, the incidence varies. But if you look at the bottom of the slide where it says unknown, there, there are a there is a great number of patients that you will never know what the etiology is. And, and that may vary from five to 25%. So again, the natural history is important. Most patients with lower GI bleed, they will stop bleeding spontaneously. And you guys have experienced this. You go see a patient in the medicine service today, you treat them conservatively, tomorrow you go see them, they're not bleeding anymore. Then you forget about them, and then two days, three days later, they call you again because they're bleeding again. There is continued or recurrent bleeding uh, in 10 to 40% of patients that present with an acute bleeding. And between five and 50% of patients with persistent bleeding, they will require some form of surgical intervention. And the, that number varies so much from five to 50 because it varies according to the cohort of patients that you're that you're studying. So that's why the, the literature varies so much. Some focus more on inflammatory diseases and some folks more on elderly patients with cancer or diverticular disease. So it's very variable, but gives you an idea that
a certain number of patients that's not negligible will require operative intervention. It is true that advances in um, endoscopy and radiology uh, with new hemostatic techniques uh, will decrease the rates of surgical intervention and rebleeding, and those techniques are pretty uh, effective. But rebleeding is common. There are a number of uh, uh, ways to uh, stratify patients according to the risk of rebleeding. Like anything in medicine, there is risk stratification. And this is just one system, the bleed system. Um, <clears throat> so if somebody has ongoing bleeding, systolic blood pressure less than 100, PT greater than 1.2 times above normal, alter mental status, or an unstable comorbid disease, this is the really, uh, really the cohort uh, of patients that will have a higher chance of rebleeding if if they stop bleeding in the first place. Uh, other risk stratification uh, methods. Uh, Straight in 2005 described seven independent predictors of severity in acute lower GI bleed, hypotension, tachycardia, syncope, non-tender abdominal exam, bleeding within four hours of presentation, use of aspirin, and more than two comorbid diseases put those patients at a much higher risk for a severe uh, acute lower GI bleed. And patients also could be stratified into three risk groups if they have more than three of those uh, risk factors described above, they have an 84% risk of severe bleeding. If they have one to three risk factors, 43% risk, and no risk factors, 9% risk. So that gives you an idea of what you should look for in addition to the GI bleed itself uh, when you go see those patients uh, that you are consulted for. In terms of the diagnosis, the real question is, why is the identification of the bleeding source so difficult? And, and we all go through this, particularly if you work with a group of gastroenterologists, they're not very aggressive during the acute bleeding. and They won't help you much finding the source, and it becomes a very tedious process. Well, there are some, some answers to that question. Uh, a number of potential sources of bleeding. So this disease can go from the, the jejunum, proximal jejunum, to the, to the anus, uh, the length of the bowel involved, uh, the need for uh, preparing the colon for, for a colonoscopy, and the intermittent nature of the bleeding. So you want to be very aggressive, but then the patient stop bleeding, you relax, and then you bleed again, and then you, you miss the opportunity to make the diagnosis. And remember that up to 40% of patients with lower GI bleed, they have more than one potential source of bleeding. That's another important thing. There is a big chance that you're gonna scope somebody with diverticular disease that has diffused diverticular disease and the colon is full of blood, that you're gonna say this is diverticular disease bleeding. And in reality, the patient has a more proximal injury that's very small, maybe angiodysplasia, maybe a small tumor, that will get missed because there is so much blood in the cone. And stigmata of recent bleeding, lower GI bleed, are infrequently identified. So when it stops, you don't see early signs of bleeding, uh, uh, similar to what you see in peptic ulcer disease or gastrointestinal uh, cancer. You need to obtain a thorough history and physical exam, uh, which uh, goes uh, simultaneously to your resuscitative efforts. Melanin or black stools indicate bleeding from an upper GI source, and bright red blood per rectum indicates bleeding from the left colon or rectum. Past medical history, a couple things may help you. If the patient tells you that uh, he had constipation or diarrhea, you've got to think about hemorrhoids or colitis. Presence of diverticulosis, you've got to think about diverticular bleeding, particularly if the patient had previous episodes of diverticulitis. If the patient has a history of previous radiation therapy, you need to think about radiation enteritis as, your, as part of your differential. A recent polypectomy, post-procedure bleeding, obvious cause, vascular disease uh, with hypotension, you've got to think about ischemic colitis. In a family history of colon cancer, you got to obviously think about colorectal neoplasm. Physical exam, hemodynamic status, as you do for any bleeding patient, most folks won't have abdominal pain. If there is abdominal pain, uh, 
an inflammatory etiology goes to the top of the list. Rectal exam is mandatory. Bright red blood per rectum is what is going to make the diagnosis to you. Uh, but eventually, some patients with very proximal lesions to the small bowel, they are still defined as lower GI bleed. They will present with melanoma. Exclusion of upper GI bleed is also important. Important. So the color of the stool is, is something that may help you. Two, two to 15% 15 of patients with uh, presumed lower GI bleed, they will have upper GI bleed. So it's very important that you do nasogastric lavage and you take a good history so you can rule out a upper GI source of bleeding that may present as melanin and may, conf may uh, confuse things. Uh, BUN creatinine ratio has been described in literature as a non-invasive test that could also help in distinguishing upper versus uh, colonic sources of bleeding. And, and when you read these papers, they say that a ratio of 33 or higher uh, has a sensitivity of 96% for upper GI bleed, although there's tremendous overlap uh, with, uh, up, uh, with lower GI bleed, especially in patients with upper GI bleed without hematemesis. And if you need to do an upper GI endoscopy, then um, uh, consider it as the gold standard for excluding an upper GI source, that, then that's what you gotta do. So this uh, table lists uh, the most current methods of diagnosis of uh, uh, gastrointestinal bleeding. Uh, colonoscopy is obviously the most common one, but you can also do angi angiography, um, radionuclide scintigraphy, and flexible sigmoidoscopy. And the slide lists the advantages and disadvantages, particularly for colonoscopy. Um, it's a very efficient and cost-effective method um, and uh, however you need to prep the bowel a little bit and most gastroenterologists um, will uh, refuse to do the uh, exam when the colon is full of blood. Very few groups, there are very aggressive gastroenterologists though, will tell you that and have reported that even in the most extreme of circumstances you do a colonoscopy and we will be able to find a cause, a source for the bleeding in greater than 90% of the cases, even if the cone is not perfectly uh, prepared. So it's out there for discussion and it all relates to how aggressive your GI group is. In geography, you don't need bowel preparation, but it's very invasive. And the most important thing about angiography is that it requires that the patient is actively bleeding. You have to have a certain degree of uh, bleeding occurring, so bleeding rate is important for angiography to be uh, more sensitive, and it's very little sensitive to venous bleeding. Uh, scintigraphy is a non-invasive test, and that's why it's so attractive. Uh, it doesn't require bowel preparation, but a couple limitations. One is non-therapeutic, so it tells you, gives you more or less an idea of where the bleeding is, but you cannot do anything uh, because the test doesn't allow you to, to intervene. Um, some argue that actually it delays therapeutic intervention, so you should use a test that makes the diagnosis and you can provide hemostasis right away. And uh, so, so there are some limitations. Flexig, obviously the limitation is that only sees part of the colon. You don't see uh, the in entirety of the large intestine and uh, although you need minimal bowel preparation, it's very easy to perform. So you, there you have it, the most common tests. And if you look at each one of these tests individually, you're gonna find that the uh, sensitivity and specificity varies quite a bit. So if you look at colonoscopy, performance of colonoscopy, this slide tells you that even if you do within 12 hours or 24 hours of admission, you will make the diagnosis in um, about 80 to 85 percent of the time. So, you know, I think we need to, uh, we just cannot be passive and accept when you call your GI colleagues that they just say, well, I can't see anything, I need to prep the colon, and you need to wait for 24 hours to see how the patient does before I do the test. Uh, that's not acceptable in, in, in this day and age because this data shows you that you know, 85, 89, 90, some studies show 
positive diagnosis uh, when you apply colonoscopy within 24 hours. Um, these are some examples of uh, lesions that you will find in your colonoscopy, angiodysplasia, colonic ischemia, you see the pale mucosa with some areas of, of bleeding, and diverticular bleed. Now, endoscopic management is very important because, uh, as I said, a large number of patients will need some degree of intervention to control the bleeding, and there are a number of thermal injection and mechanical strategies using uh, colonoscopy uh, to uh, control bleeding. The most common ones are thermal, but uh, injection of epinephrine, uh, alcohol, uh, and other uh, substances are not um, uncommon. And obviously very skilled um, GI uh, specialists use uh, hemoclips and band ligations and endoloops uh, all the time. So you have a, a number of options uh, to choose from. Uh, radionuclide scintigraphy, if you look at uh, positive scan uh, percentage, uh, it varies uh, quite a bit. And, uh, and, uh, and also the bleeding site being confirmed by this test is very variable, and I think it depends on primarily the disease process that, that uh, is the main ideology of the bleeding. Uh, that uh, affects the performance of the test. In geography, uh, the same thing. Uh, the positive percentage varies quite a bit from low 20s to the high, or to the low 70s, high 60s. And, and the reason here is whether the, the, injury, the lesion is in the small bowel or in the large bowel. Now, this is the new technology that has uh, been used in recent years, wireless capsule endoscopy, and people got very excited about this. Uh, you can find sources in the stomach, in the small bowel, and in the colon. But if you really read this literature very carefully, there is minimal or absolutely no role for wireless capsule endoscopy in the diagnosis of acute lower GI bleed. If your intestine is filled with blood, this won't work. So the, the initial excitement fell apart when people realized that it's a major limitation of the technology. This is a little camera camera that you swallow and you take pictures of your, your intestine and if the intestine is filled with blood, you're not gonna see it. So this is probably a, a very good uh, option and alternative for the conventional methods that I just described when patients uh, have stopped bleeding and you haven't made the diagnosis. And you need to investigate the small bowel. It's very uh, useful for proximal lesions and not very useful for colonic be in lesions because you have colonoscopy. So for those that have stopped bleeding and you don't have an etiology, this may help you. And these are some of the things that you can see, use ulcerations of the small bowel, angiodysplasia of the small bowel, are, are some examples. Now there has been some excitement about helical CT. And this is worth uh, reviewing uh, briefly with you uh, because some recent studies uh, suggest that helical CT may be a pretty decent way of looking at people with uh, acute uh, lower GI bleed. So the studies are small, but people have described uh, uh, pulling of contrast uh, and um, diagnosis of small bowel hemorrhage and colonic hemorrhages in a fair number of patients. And uh, so this is out there. People have uh, used it. It's easy to obtain. Everybody has access to helical CT nowadays. And perhaps it's, uh, it's superior to some of the conventional methods. This is an interesting table that compares helical CT and geography performance with conventional angiography according to the site of the injury. And if you pay attention to this table, you will see that helical CT and geography was performing very well in proximal, uh, uh, injury, in proximal, proximal uh, lesions and didn't do so well uh, in very few cases, one in the right colon and two in the jejunum. When you look at conventional angiography, Conventional angiography uh, didn't do very well 
uh, in the terminal ilium and particularly in the left column. Uh, and, and we understand based on the anatomy of the, the circulation of the left colon and the splenic flexure why that, could, that would be. Now, if you try to correlate location, the test, and the diagnosis, you will see that conventional angiography didn't do very well in inflammatory disease, Meckel's and ulcerative colitis. Um, whereas uh, helical CT didn't do very well in very small lesions such as angiodysplasia. So there you have it, um, but it's available out there, and it seems that there is not significant difference between overall performance comparing helical CT angiography and conventional angiography. Now, how about when you can't do anything, you can't find the etiology, how about surgical management? Well, remember, first concept is this is pathology specific. So if you have a diagnosis, you obviously can do a much better operation. Now, there is this, this uh, condition that we call bleeding of unknown origin. You, patient continues to bleed, you can't find a source. So what are your options? This is when surgeons need to be very thoughtful because this may be a very uh, tough situation for us in the operating room. Your options are basically intraoperative endoscopy. So you have the belly open and you can help the endoscopist to run the bowel uh, with the endoscope. And, and the, the question is always the bleeding site, is it in the small bowel or in the colon? So before you start manipulating uh, the bowel, you gotta look and the brief period of observation may tell you a lot. If there is no blood in the small bowel and most of the blood's in the colon, that makes your decision a lot easier. Now, as you start manipulating the colon, some blood may get into the small bowel. So again, when you open the abdomen, avoid sudden manipulation of the bowel until you can define where is the blood. This is uncommon. Less than 10% of all causes of lower GI bleed, um, you will find an etiology prior to going to the operating room. An investigation of a small bowel source is warranted you can do a small bowel follow through x-rays and anthroclysis, and this is not very good for diagnosis, but people have done it. Or you can do push enteroscopy or small bowel enteroscopy, which uh, has a diagnostic yield of 40 to 50 percent. Angiodysplasia is as commonly identified as the source of bleeding. Uh, radionuclide uh, red cell scans and angiography can be done in capsule endoscopy only if the patient is not bleeding. The real question is, now you have obscure gastrointestinal bleeding, what you do in the operating room? So there's a, a couple things that you need to know because you may be asked this question if you take your boards. 10% of patients require surgical intervention without having bleeding identified. I said that before. The first maneuver is to perform a thorough exploration. You need to know where the most of the blood is. If there are no obvious sources of bleeding, an intraoperative colonoscopy may be the first thing you want to do. So you evacuate all the blood from the cone and do a colonoscopy. Um, intraoperative enteroscopy can help you investigate obscure sources of small ball hemorrhage. Uh, so you've got to help the endoscopist to do it. And if the bleeding source can be isolated to the cone, as I said, if you open up and most of the blood's in the cone, then a total abdominal colectomy with an iliorectal anastomosis or an ileostomy is a pretty decent alternative. Uh, and you know, if you have to do a subtotal colectomy instead of a partial colectomy, that's the way it is because you didn't have the diagnosis. So there is a price that you pay, a price that the patient pays, but you know, you, this is a life-saving operation. It's not a, uh, an operation that you wanna do twice or three times. This is an operation to do only once. So, so don't hesitate. In terms of outcomes, although this is an important problem, common problem, if you look at mortality, it's not very high. Considering overall mortality varies from three to 5% or maybe 2%, uh, but acute rebleeding is very, very common, up to 25%, 30%, and delayed rebleeding is also common. So as you can see, in series that have a higher incidence of acute rebleeding, there is a higher uh, percentage of patients that underwent an operative intervention. And uh, the number of PEC red cells transfused is also much higher.
Mortality ranges from 0 to 25 percent. Most deaths are not the direct result of uncontrolled bleeding, but rather exacerbation of an underlying disorder or development of a nosocomial complication. Uh, and comorbidities are, are also important um, in the uh, final outcome. So to, to wrap this up, um, Jeannie came up with uh, this algorithm that I changed just a little bit, and, and I want to present to you. I usually think this way when I'm dealing with a lower GI bleeding patient. So it was, it was a good thing that we put this together. The critical decision is how much the patient has bled and how many units one has transfused. Is if you haven't reached the four unit threshold, I would submit to you that um, a red cell scan uh, or a CT may be a very good alternative or a good screening. Uh, and if it's positive, uh, then you need to to go on to take to to um, order another test that will be more specific in terms of the etiology and, and, and localization. But if it's negative, it, it helps you because then all you may need to do is just a colonoscopy. Now, if the patient has reached the uh, four unit threshold uh, and the patient's hemodynamically stable, uh, I think that you need to prep the colon, you start with the colonoscopy because your diagnostic yields much higher. And if it's localized, then you can intervene endoscopically, injections, thermal, or clipping, and if unsuccessful, you go to the operating room. If you're successful, you observe. If your colonoscopy cannot localize, but the bleeding has stopped, you can observe and try to work up the patient in an elective fashion. If the patient is hemodynamically unstable, obviously, you always need to consider going immediately to the operating room and paying the price for that decision, but again, this may be a life-saving operation. Uh, you, in the operating room, you should consider on-table endoscopy versus subtotal colectomy or, or other more aggressive interventions. If you have time, you can resuscitate and take the patient to, to the angio suite because there is active bleeding and that's the requirement for that test to be positive. You may be able to localize the bleeding and some would argue that a super selective embolization may help you temporize the situation and then undergo uh, an operative intervention in much better clinical condition. If the angiography cannot localize, then you, your, your only alternative is to go to the operating room and you do an on-table endoscopy or a more extensive procedure such as subtotal colectomy. So this gives it you, at least to you, an, an opportunity uh, to think this through but I think that hemodynamic instability, the number of units transfused, and whether or not you are applying the right test is important to know. So it gives you some guidance. Any questions?